Seat Leon has had a facelift, one so minor you hardly notice it. Just a few totten blinds and a few new features like the traffic jam assist and front assist system. Seat introduced these two systems in the Ateca and now they're installed in the new Leon, but the highlights are in the interior. Inside, car tester Michel Assenmacher likes how the touch display replaces a number of buttons, and especially the inductive charging station. Her cell phone can't make use of it, but later models can be charged without a cable here. The interior seems familiar and well-structured. The materials are higher quality now. Ambient lighting provides an individual flair. As is typical in a station wagon, the back seat is roomy with plenty of legroom. But if you take a look at the exterior, you'll notice a few new design components. For example, the angular LED headlights. The sideline has been noticeably revised. Overall, the facelift, though minimal, gives the Leon a sharper, more modern look. The Leon's trunk holds 587 liters. A simple lever effortlessly folds down the back seat for more storage space. We're testing the Leon STFR with a 1.8 TSI gasoline engine. It generates 132 kilowatts for a top speed of 226 kilometers an hour and pushes the car to 107.8 seconds. This variant can be had for a little more than 26,000 euros in Germany. Michelle says the Seat Leon drives very comfortably, but despite the formula racing equipment, it doesn't feel very sporty. The engine does have enough power to make curvy roads fun to drive, though. FR is the name for the equipment line. It means little more than a sporty look. To attract drivers to company cars, Seat offers a new equipment package called Excellence for a more elegant, luxurious interior. Overall, the revised Seat Leon cuts a good figure, says Michel. The manufacturer has merely freshened up the exterior and interior a bit without sacrificing charm. The new Leon comes in four variants and offers a choice of three gasoline and three diesel engines. In Lapland, practically every household owns a snowmobile. That's because polar winters are long and snowy. And besides, snowmobiles are so much fun. But our car tester Matas Kurat says snowmobiles have some downsides too. For one, you're always out in the cold. And second, you're stuck to driving on snow. Anything else will ruin the snowmobile's runners. The all-wheel drive Porsche Macan, in contrast, is much more versatile. It's now available in an even more powerful version, namely with the Macan Turbo Performance Package. The Macan was launched in 2014 and since established itself as a sporty compact SUV. Over 200,000 units have sold since then. Our test car is the even more powerful Porsche Macan with the performance package. Mata says the difference is not so great between the regular Macan Turbo and the Macan Turbo with the performance package. The German engineers have mainly enhanced the car's output. The V6 engine now has an output of 324 kilowatts. That's 30 kilowatts more than in the regular Macan Turbo. In 
addition, it comes with a supersized brake system and the Macan GTS suspension. PSM and PTM drive assist systems are standard features in this Macan Turbo. They make driving on wintry roads extra safe and enjoyable. Mata says you can see just how effective Porsche's traction management or PTM works on this slight incline. There are several options. First, Matis will activate Porsche's regular stability management or PSM. Normalem PSM, also dem Stabilitätsmanagement eingeschaltet. In the PTM, the all-wheel drive is configured as a controlled hang-on system. If the rear wheels start spinning, more power is distributed to the front by a greater engagement of the multi-plate clutch. Matis knows that you can turn off the stability management. This reduces the vehicle's traction on inclines. Note at the top, stability management is activated. Below, traction management has been disabled. It's also possible to set the Porsche to off-road mode, says Matis. This elevates the car somewhat. This mode also allows variable distribution of drive force between front and rear axles, making it easier to take inclines. It's obviously silly to do this at full speed, but Matis thinks that's the best way to test the system. Next challenge, the slalom course. Matis will set the stability management to sport mode for this challenge. Otherwise, it will break too much when sliding, and sliding's half the fun. This instrument shows you quite nicely just how intelligently the all-wheel drive distributes power between front and back. Mata says the Macan Turbo with a performance package is plenty of fun to drive on snow and ice, but he's also extremely tempted to hop back onto this sporty snowmobile, given that he's in snowy Lapland, when in Rome, or in wintry Finland, rather. BMW has completely revamped its Mini family. After three-door, five-door, convertible, and Clubman models, dealers will receive the new Countryman in early 2017. In 2010, the Countryman allowed the Mini to enter the compact SUV class. The new Countryman will be available in Cooper, Cooper D, and SD editions. Prices for the 100 kilowatt Countryman Cooper without all-wheel drive start at 26,500 euros. To kick off the new year, Mazda is now offering its convertible two-seater MX-5 with an electric roof system. The hardtop opens in 13 seconds, but only at speeds of up to 10 kilometers an hour. The entry-level engine for the MX-5 RF is the Skyactiv G160 with 118 kilowatts of power. It consumes 6.9 liters of fuel per 100 kilometers. The basic version costs just under 30,000 euros in Germany. The mid-range segment is very competitive, says car tester Emanuel Schaefer, especially the station wagons. Many renowned German manufacturers offer such a vehicle, like the Audi A4, BMW's 3 Series, Opel's Insignia, the Ford Mondeo, and so forth. That makes it tough for foreign brands like the Toyota Avensis. Last year, sales of the Avensis didn't even reach 4,000 in Germany. Compare that with VW, which can sell that many cars in two weeks. So the question is whether the Toyota Avensis is rightly avoided or an insider tip. Einfach schlecht oder ist es vielleicht einfach nur ein Geheimtipp? 
A car's design is a matter of taste, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The Toyota Avensis Touring Sports offers a choice of two gasoline and two diesel engines. We're testing the most powerful diesel with two liters displacement and 105 kilowatts of power. This engine accelerates the station wagon to 100 and 9.8 seconds. Top speed is 200 kilometers an hour. Emanuel says Toyota developed the Avensis engines in collaboration with BMW, but Toyota doesn't offer an engine with more than 110 kilowatts or 150 horsepower. That's where other cars in the segment, like Mazda, are just starting out. A 130 kilowatt engine used to be offered for the Avensis, but Toyota retired it. It was purchased so rarely that it wasn't worth producing. So the Avensis isn't striving for sportiness so much as for thrift. The curves on the front make the Japanese car seem a bit chubby-cheeked, but the roof line descending to the rear is almost elegant. Storage space in the Avensis station wagon's trunk is between 543 and 1,609 liters. In comparison, the Passat trunk holds up to 1,780 liters. Emmanuel has mixed feelings about the interior. Some parts are good, others a bit dismal. Starting with the plastic on the door handle. It has all the charm of a utility vehicle, he says. But he finds the instrument cluster very attractive. Simple, but nice. Just like the center console. There, the sat-nav and various switches are all simple but nice. In contrast, the controls on the steering wheel seem thrown together. What bothers Emmanuel the most is the gray on the gear shift. It's not found anywhere else in the car. Down here, there's gray too, but it's mutt. And it's found nowhere else in the car either. It's ghastly and doesn't fit with the rest of the car. To Emmanuel, the noise level inside the Avensis seems a little louder than in most competitors. It's not terribly loud, but it could definitely be quieter, especially when you accelerate. Beyond 2,000 RPM, you clearly notice it. But the engine needs those revs to really get any power. Nothing's lacking in the Avensis when it comes to safety. A pre-collision system, lane departure alert, automatic high beam assistant, and many other systems simplify and protect the driver's and passenger's lives. Road sign assist warns the driver when he exceeds the speed limit. It's all subsumed under the title Safety Sense, and that's standard equipment in all equipment lines. After spending a day in the Avensis, Emmanuel says he understands why it sells so poorly. The design is polarizing. Not everyone likes it. Apparently, most people don't like it. The entry-level price, a bit above 24,000 euros in Germany, is lower than most other cars in the segment, but for just 1,600 euros more, you get an Opel Insignia, and for another 2,000, you arrive at the VW Passat. And both of them have a much better design and more storage space, making them more practical for everyday use mehr Kofferraumvolumen und sind entsprechend praktischer für den Alltag. Rainer Unruh is testing out the new BMW G310R with a one-cylinder engine. He says this 34-horsepower entry-level model is made for people who've just got their motorcycle license. So he's going for a spin around Hollywood to see what the bike can do. And he's got company. Automotive journalist Stefan Schätzle is also testing out this lean machine on two wheels. He and Reiner get ready to take off. Right from the start, the bike proves easy to use. It weighs in at just 160 kilos, making it nimble and easy to control. 
an anti-lock braking system comes as standard, improving safety. With the G310R, BMW hopes to open up new markets worldwide by offering a good quality bike for a low price. Take Brazil, says BMW's Marcus Kemper. There, a 300cc motorcycle is a big mid-range bike, so we can't achieve the sales volume with our current portfolio as with the G310R. The little bike was developed in Munich by the firm's motorcycle division, BMW Motorrad. But it's assembled in India by partner firm TVS Motor Company. The bike has a small headlight fairing with a striking headlight. Its proportions are typical for a roadster, beefy at the front and sleek at the back. The motorcycle's engine and suspension are newly developed, and unusually, the engine's lone cylinder is tilted to the rear. Stefan says the engine's installed the wrong way around, or in this case, the right way. So air comes in at the front and exhaust goes out the back, and the whole thing's tilted forward slightly. That's advantageous as the center of gravity is lower and farther forward. The swing arm's been lengthened accordingly to 65 centimeters, which improves handling. The relaxed seating position is supposed to ensure laid-back and stress-free driving in both the city and the countryside. Rainer says the bike feels good on curves and he can really speed along. It's a typical BMW. He's thrilled by the 310's agility. It's good on curves and on the road. What Rainer doesn't like is the lack of power. He's used to riding bigger bikes and feeling the force of the engine beneath him. And he misses that here. Stefan Schetzel says it's a BMW. He expects a BMW to ride well and make a good impression in terms of quality, and it does that. The bike's light and extremely agile, but never feels small and wobbly. It rides just like you'd expect a motorbike should. It's just a bit lighter and less powerful than bigger models. Reiner's verdict? Good things come in small packages. It's a nice bike for beginners. Personally, he'd buy a bigger one, but then he's an experienced rider. This bike's ideal for the city and short stints, but not on long trips. The G310R has a starting price of just under 5,000 euros in Germany. Due to problems with the gearbox, delivery has been delayed until the spring. Hopefully then, customers will receive a motorcycle that's up to BMW's traditionally high standards. It was one of automotive history's odd men out. Exploring the Italian Alps in an eccentric vintage car is a rare experience. The Cord A12 looks a bit like the caffeine fit of a mad cap designer, or maybe like a masterpiece by a brilliant automobile tycoon. As car tester Christoph Bauer tells us, hardly anyone knows Ered Loban Kord's name today, but he was a shining example of the American dream. He started small as a gas station attendant and car salesman, and worked his way up to become owner of the Auburn and Duesenberg car makers, two of the most renowned car companies of the time. In 1929, he launched a third company named after himself, Kord Automobiles. Kord Automobiles. As a young but experienced entrepreneur, Ered Loban Kord should have put the wishes and needs of his customers first, but he didn't. He used the Kord automobile to experiment, to build a car that would be new and different.
From the beginning, Cord stood out for its striking design and innovative technologies. A 1929 front-wheel drive made its American debut in the first Cord model, the L29. The A12 SC also put the power on the front axle, practically unheard of at the time. But the powerful turbocharged V8 engine quickly pushed the narrow tires to the limits of their traction. The Cord had trouble handling tight curves. Even so, it was one of the fastest cars of its day. With the help of its streamlined body, the Cord 812 SC achieved a top speed of 160 kilometers per hour. The original advertising brochure boasted that the reduction of drag was a crucial factor, a new concept at the time, like most of the Cord's technical components. Christoph describes the cord as a dream for beginning drivers. If they happened to stall the cord's engine, the driver just had to step on the clutch and it automatically started again. And it shifted with a flick of a finger, tiptoeing through the three gears plus overdrive semi-automatically. And at a time when few cars even had windshield wipers, the cord had variable speed wipers. It was the first car with a radio as standard equipment and hidden headlights. In the 1930s, that was as sophisticated as technology got. What a mean nose, says Christoph. That's the impression this cord must have made at the time, with its massive wrap-around chrome grille, the pop-up headlights, and above all these chromed external pipes. The car must have seemed like some bizarre insect from a faraway galaxy. Gordon Blurick, a world-famous industrial designer at the time, put little value on understatement, but a lot on elegance and aerodynamics. This was one of the first cars with door hinges mounted inside. Till then, they'd always been sticking out, looking a bit chunky. The design of the cord was a perfect dream, but only its design. In the 1930s, the Cord 812 and its optically identical predecessor, the 810, revolutionized American automotive design with its harmonious and sweeping lines. The three hearts in the logo were said to stand for E.L. Cord's love for his cars. That's easy to believe given the breathtaking detail of this work of art on wheels. The fine aluminum dashboard with easily readable instruments, the filigree shifting gate, the many sculpted levers and dignified club atmosphere show Cord's automotive vision extends into the interior as well. The hood is what gave the cord the nickname Coffin Nose. It enclosed a V8 engine made by Lycoming, one of the leading American aircraft engine builders. Normally, it put out some 125 horsepower, but this SC version with a Schweitzer Cummins centrifugal supercharger achieved 170 horsepower and a top speed of 160 kilometers per hour, faster than almost any other production car at the time. In combination with the supercharger's hum, the V8 and its 4.7-liter capacity produced an unparalleled sound. The Cord's engine was prone to overheating, the transmission to jumping out of gear, and the cooling system to leaking and its nearly 1.7 tons proved far less manageable than the dynamic design made it appear. In just eight years, Cord had gone bust. Christoph Bauer concludes that the Cord may have been one of America's most innovative makes, but it was also certainly one of its most short-lived. Even so, it was a good 30 years ahead of its time in design, aerodynamics, and technology. But as so often with innovators, their true value is often only recognized when it's too late. Today, it's obvious. The Cord A12 was a milestone in automotive history. Only about 3,000 Cord A12s were ever built. 134 of them are the coveted supercharged SC version. The Cord took its sisters, Auburn and Duesenberg, down with it. What's left is the beauty, the elegance, and the dream. <laughs>